In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt shall renew the, the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, that instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise and ever rejoice in this consolation through the Saint Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray, pray for, for us. us. Saint Joseph, pray, pray for us. Father Lanteri, pray for us. Saint Ignatius, pray for us. Saint Brandine of Siena, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy so me and Eric would like to wish Mary happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mary. Happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we'd just like to thank Mary for uh, all that you've done in the parish in the past few years and the exercises and Mary in consecration and helping posting blogs and helping send off books and, uh, and phone calls and facilitating. But it, it's so much. It is. But especially um, for your great love for Jesus and Mary and for your friendship. So we'd like to just thank you very, very much. We're very yeah. appreciative. And in the Mass in the morning, uh, I offer the Mass for you, as well as for your, your father, Ed, and your mother. I prayed for her also, yes. whose thank name is you. Helen. Helen. So that was our, our gift to you. So, thank you so happy much, birthday, Father. and we're very happy to have you with us. Yes. Thank you, Eric, Absolutely, thank you, Father, yes. so much. Sure. Father, all those different responsibilities that she has, uh, Mary is a weapon in the spiritual exercises program. She's like the Swiss army knife of the exercises. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great image. I like that. I like that. A weapon. I like that weapon. I'd like to talk again about John Paul II. But... Um, Maybe we could start off by uh, talking about the saint that we celebrate today on her birthday. Yes. And I think you're learning a little bit about this saint. Can we talk about him, Eric? Yes. Um, his name is Saint Bernardine of Siena. Okay? And uh, he, um, he lived in the 1300s and 1400s. Very interesting life. I was reading... Um, by Father Salisman this morning in Spanish, and um, I'd like to just to share a little bit that I learned today, and then we can maybe talk about that, and then we'll go back to John Paul II. He's born in Italy, in the tail end of the 1300s, but he lost his parents when he was a child, both his mom and his dad. But look at Divine Providence. His, uh, so his relative, his aunt, uh, take him in, and uh, I guess there's a couple of aunts, but especially one that just decided to really form him. Uh, form him spiritually, morally, intellectually. And uh, so uh, the plague breaks, uh, breaks out. 1400, the, the typhus, the bubonic plague, it breaks out, and he decides that he's going to dedicate himself to help out these poor people. So he and a group of people that were consecrated to Mary dedicated themselves, but other people fled because it was kind of like the coronavirus, but much worse. Much worse. Many people, people are dying like flies. And um, so uh, he, he, he dedicates himself to that for several months, and he ends up with a fever. So he's got he's to gotta rest. Once he bounces back, his aunt gets sick. So he spends a whole year with his aunt. A couple of things that happened in his childhood that I'd like to tell. He was a, a very um, pious but very highly intelligent child. One occasion, uh, a boy uh, tempted him, someone tempted him against the verge of purity, and he smacked the guy in the face. What would happen that happened today? That wouldn't be politically correct, would it? No. Then shortly after that, uh, someone else tried to incite someone to commit an, some act of impurity, 
and they threw mud in the face of this kid. So he and the others, they, they bombed him with, wow. with mud bombs, and he never <laughs> attempted to do that again. No? So you see, it's very nation, death rather than sin. Even as a child, he had this real Beautiful. repulsion to sin, repugnance to sin. Then, um, when his aunt passes away, he becomes a Franciscan. And uh, for about 12 years, he's basically in the convent. There he's in the convent, in the monastery, praying and studying. And finally, one of the novices cries out and says, Bernardino, you can't be hiding your gifts. This happens a few days, and Superior says, well, go off. And he goes into Milan to preach. Problem is this, he had a very weak voice. He had very weak vocal cords, and um, he didn't have microphones back then, did they? I don't think so. So the Blessed Mother interceded for him and gave him his voice. And he preached to thousands and thousands of people. And uh, they tr you see sometimes a picture with him, he's got three mitres, which would be the, the bishops had at his feet, because he was asked three times to be a bishop, and he said, no, I don't want any oh, of that. Wow. But he spent like 27 years of his life preaching, and thousands of people would come. He preached on the ugliness of sin and the beauty of virtue, and someone listened to him, was so impressed that he wrote down his sermons, and they were considered to be model sermons for future preachers. He got up really early to pray, but also to prepare his homilies. And um, he was chosen to be the head of a very strict observance of the Franciscans. When he started, there was 300 in Italy. When he ended, 4,000. Wow, that's impressive. From 300 to 4,000. But what he's very famous for also, you may have seen IHS, the letters. Those are the three Greek words in Gothic letters uh, for Jesus Christ, Son of God. So he would preach with that emblem and it would be blazoned by fire and he really was strong in preaching the holy name of Jesus. So uh, I, I, I felt very, very um, inspired by reading his life today and actually preached on him in the morning. And I, he was the greatest preacher in the, uh, in the four, early 1400s. Great preacher. Eric, you're called to be a preacher. Can you do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've tried that before, Father, with my family. Sometimes it doesn't always go over so well. Uh, but uh, How about the exercise? Well, or, yeah, absolutely. Or discernment. Yeah, teaching and, uh -huh. teaching and preaching. I guess a lot of times we don't really think about the, um, you know, the, uh, the oral communications as being preaching, but it, um, I suppose it really is. I mean, we're using... Uh, you know, using our voice to spread the word, to spread the gospel, mm -hmm. and that's one way to do it. You said that um, St. Um, Bernardine was a Franciscan, right? And so sometimes St. Francis, uh, and I don't know if this is just a, a pious tale, but they say that he used to say, uh, always preach the gospel, and if you have to, use words. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of times that's... Um, attributed to St. Francis, but uh, that's uh, very beautiful. The other thing that, um, fr from what you were relating, is the um, what he did with the bubonic plague, and helping those sick people, and now we can relate to that. I mean, you think about the caregivers that are risking their lives, even caregivers that are, like, I've heard that people are flying into, had been flying into New York from other states, California, and there was this one man that um, I heard that he flew out there to help and he, he caught the virus and he died. But it also reminds me, being a Franciscan, how um, you know he w went out and helped these people with this deadly disease, how St. Francis uh, befriended the leopard 
uh, the leper, <laughs> leopard. And he then, did like animals, by yes, the way. He yeah. did. <laughs> the leper. Uh, but he, uh, he exchanged clothes with uh, the leper, and so that was one of the charisms of, of St. Francis. So, And uh, you mentioned earlier, too, uh, being the patron saint of uh, our local uh, sister city of San Bernardino. And uh, you know, a lot of people really don't relate to that or to know much about their patron. Well, Mary, you're rejoicing in celebrating your birthday. May is the month of Mary. Eric celebrated his birthday, if I'm not mistaken, 15 days ago. Uh, Cinco de Mayo, your yes. Spanish si. is improving by si. leaps and bounds, as we notice, right? And <laughs> no, no, Padre. <laughs> so, Mary, I think it, you started off on a really good foot uh, today with uh, the Mass and Communion, the Mass offered for you and your mom and your dad, and now when the Ignatian Foreign. You, uh, you really look like you're in consolation, look like you're beaming peace and joy. Is that, you look like you're radiant, yes. You know, I, you know, if we're not in consolation, we'll just have to bask in your presence that's and she'll right. be inundating us with consolation. Is that, re- yeah, is that that's, true? That's right, that's right. So what's on your mind, Mary? I'm filled with celebrate? consolation. That's good. Um, well, one, uh, I woke up and I was... This morning, I was so grateful to God and to my mom and dad for my life. Thanking my mom and dad for being open to life. I was the fourth of five children, and she probably had some miscarriages. They were open to life. And they were very good parents. And I was just thanking God he gave me life. He chose to create me. And my mom and dad said yes to life so that I could, I could, be, I could come into being. So, I'm so I was so grateful. I was filled with consolation with that. And then um, that's why I asked that my mom and my dad be remembered at Mass. I said, if you don't want to pray for me, pray for my mom and dad, because they're the ones I'm thinking today. And um, I'm grateful for. And, um, and then to, to be able to have Mass set for me, um, what can I say? That's the gift of all gifts, Jesus. So, um, so I'm already high on consolation and then... Um, I will share, Father Ed gave me some, ho- some holy cards, and just, just um, you said a humble gift, and I'm going, when I opened it, just saw some holy cards there, and different ones, and I thought, you couldn't give me any greater gift, these are my friends, the saints, and so I started reading about them, and praying to them if I didn't know them, and I was just, so my consolation kept increasing, and I said, I better, I better calm down, I better calm down <laughs> before I go into, into the um, forum, but, so it's just, um, the, the day with my with Jesus and Mary, with with Father Ed, with Eric, with all of my spiritual family. Um, now you know it's my birthday, and I know that you're sharing it with me, and all the saints and angels in heaven. And so I'm I'm just really grateful today, just just really grateful. But I do have to make a confession. I can't imagine why I never ever looked up who was the saint on the day I was born. It didn't occur to me till yesterday to do it, and I went, St. Bernadine, because for my confirmation name, I chose the name Bernadette, because I, I love St. Bernadette. I love her, her relationship with Mary. I love her humility. I love her willingness to serve, to love. Um, and I love how she was willing to suffer for Mary and for Christ. So she's a model for me in so many areas. So it's a model that I'm far from imitating, but dr- striving to imitate. But um, St. Bernadine, Bernadette and Bernadine. And then, then I thought, I have to read up on this saint, and what do you do? You preach on him. <laughs> and I went, oh, thank you, Father. I was just wondering who this saint was. So um, I just, uh, I think that, and we've been talking about St. John Paul II, so I don't know. The saints really are our best friends, and, and if they're our best friends here, they'll be our best friends in heaven. Yes. You know, the thought that occurred to me um, about three and a half years ago, talking about family, uh, my father passed away. I think both of you met him because he would come to visit me about every other year with my mom for some occasion. And um, I have a lot of fond memories. Uh, But when I um, I was able to preach the homily mass for him in New Hampshire and... uh, 
thing that really occurred to me is this, the importance of family that you mentioned. Yes. And uh, now when I make my holy hour, uh, we all go through different stages of hopefully development in our spiritual life. I kind of divide my, um, my life into belonging to different families. And I'll mention them. And this is what occurred to me when I was preaching uh, for, uh, for my father's funeral mass. He died on October 1st, which is St. Therese, her feast day, uh, in uh, uh, 2016 so it's already three and a half years, is um, thankful for uh, my natural family that like you, if it weren't for uh, mom and dad, I wouldn't be here physically, but also I, I think I, I just have to owe my vocation to them. I'm thankful for that. Uh, I'm very thankful. And I'll, I'll say it, and with all humility, uh, is uh, I was brought up in a family that was not dysfunctional. I mean, you can't say that today. It's very rare can you say, meet a family that is not dysfunctional, either very dysfunctional, basically rent apart, or serious problems, or just kind of dysfunctional. No? It was a family in which we, um, a big family, uh, seven children, my parents, I mean, they adopted two more later on uh, when they were teenagers because my uncle and my aunt died and le left uh, their kids and my parents said, well, yeah. even though they already, I think we had, they had four teenagers, well, well, we'll accept them and just trust in God's divine providence. No? Um, then I'm thankful also for um, my religious family. That I belong to the Oblates, and so do you, both of you. Yes, we do. And, and so do you. We all belong to the Oblates, yes? Yes. yes. Uh, and I think as our Ignatian Forum is um, developing, it's just a fledgling group. And we don't have 50 years of this group. We only have about maybe about eight or nine weeks, right? It's a fledgling group that's just uh, basically being born. You know how we're at, how we're adding new elements to it. We had Father Craig on Monday, Father Larry yesterday, and we're um, we're developing this group. It's, but I really feel that this is um, uh, Oblate family is a family, but also feel more and more connection with um, with you people that are with us. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm just looking, I'm looking at a a phone. I know that there are people beyond that. <laughs> we know but there's. You're there. uh, <laughs> But it's really good to know that this is a family also. And I really feel that the, uh, the parish is a family too. Yes. And they feel that there's a bond between those who have done the exercises, they've done their holy hour. There's a real uh, family bond in that area. But um, probably one of the most intimate bonds I notice is when someone has a a real love for Mary and the Rosary and his consecrated Mary, there's just, there's a connection, there's a bond that is established be between those who have this love for Mary and recognize Mary as as her mother. And then uh, finally, I'd have to say that that basically heaven, heaven is a family. Because mm -hmm. in heaven you've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that's a family. Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, mutual love between the Father and the Son. That's the Holy Spirit. The angels and the saints. Once we die, we're going to be in a, a loving family for all eternity. So, um, I just over the past couple of years, I've, uh, that's, that's part of my prayer life. It's part of my spirituality. Is uh, We're not called to be loners. We're not called to walk the path along. We're called to be in communion with others. In our refectory this afternoon, I was looking at a painting we have on the wall. It's, it's the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Mm -hmm. Is that Jesus was walking to these two men and you can see Jesus talking and they're listening. There's a bond of family and friendship. 
Um, Eric, does this resonate to you that you you feel that there's a um, uh, just a, a whole concept of family is important? What do you think? It's uh, the, the evolution of this conversation. I think is very uh, consoling. Uh, Mary talking about her gratitude today, uh, you know, for for her parents and her family and. Uh, and Father Ed just you're kind of expanding the topic of family and uh, how important it is. Like you said, uh, uh, I, I, I don't do well as a loner at all myself. And uh, I do like, uh, I like to have uh, time more uh, alone. I, I don't mind living alone. I feel that it's a blessing, but uh, the Lord has given all of us a balance, but the um, the importance of the family. I mean, just looking back uh, on my own life, and you know, a lot of the most difficult times in my life have happened in the last fifteen or twenty years since I've come here, and uh, you know, the importance of uh, Jesus and Mary and the strengthening of those relationships in the context of the church. Uh, and especially, I'd say, this parish. You talked about the parish family and the family that we have here uh, have, uh, have been uh, absolutely required for me. Uh, and, you know, like you said, Father, uh, we can't do it alone. But all these different ideas of family, I think, are very uh, consoling, but also gives me a great security we look at the, um, you know, the heavenly family, the the communion of saints that you mentioned, um, and the um, the church itself, and then the parish. Those are very powerful family and familial connections that we all have. And you know, I, as Father Ed and Mary said, I hope that all of you know that you're definitely part of this family, which is is extremely important to us. Mary, would you like to expound upon that a little bit more? Sure. I, I was sitting here thinking of, um, sometimes I've talked with people about the communion of saints, and my understanding and appreciation of communion of saints as family has grown. And so a few things I learned and I shared, and, and um, people, I hadn't heard it before, and, I, and they hadn't either. So, um, for example... Well, we know that Jesus and Mary can hear our prayers and answer them, and then we're told we can pray to the saints. So they hear our prayers, and they can, they can pray for us, intercede for us, and they're answered. So we can communicate with the saints in heaven. So, um, but the, uh, that's the church triumphant, the church uh, militant on earth. I know I can ask all of you to pray for me, and you will. And you ask me to pray for you, and I will. And we will pray for each other. But purgatory, I was a little hazy on, and, and I would pray for the souls in purgatory. And... Um, but I went to confession one time to Father Antolini, and this was a few years ago, a number of years ago, and he uh, he told me to pray to the souls in purgatory for my penance. And I said, um, okay, I, I'll pray for the souls in purgatory. He said, no, I didn't say pray for them. He said, I, I said, pray to them. I said, what? And he said, they, in the souls in purgatory, cannot pray for themselves. That's why we have to pray for them. We have to pray for them but they can pray for us. And he said, don't just pray to one soul. Ask all the souls in purgatory to pray for you, and they will. Now, isn't that amazing, family? Isn't that beautiful? So since then, I've been doing that. I, I pray for them, and I pray to them that they all will pray for me to help me get to heaven uh, and for my needs. So that's one uh, extension of family that I, that I came to appreciate and love. Um, the other thing is Jesus said that uh, we are to be charitable to our brothers and sisters, and we are to look on the least of these as our brothers and sisters. So um, I, when I can, I give a few dollars to someone if I see them uh, on the street, and if, if, the stops, if the stoplight stops, I can hand it to them. I do, and I said, Mary, if you want me to give them something, you've got to stop the stoplight, because if I have to go green, I can't give them anything. So when, when the stoplight is stopped, and I can give them something, I do. But I started, I started asking them to pray for me, I just, I said, well, I'll ask them to pray for me. Maybe that'll get them praying. I'll tell them, I'll pray for you, but I, will you please pray for me? But the other day I was, I was motivated, I think, by something we said in here. I was motivated. There was a, a kind of a younger man, but 
you know, obviously in need. And and the light was light was red, so I handed him something. And I said, I said, listen, um, will you pray for me? And he goes, yes, yeah, I will. And I said, okay. I said, and I'll pray for you. And then he was so engaged talking to me. I said, let's go to heaven together, okay? And he went, what? I said, let's go to heaven together. You pray for me, I'll pray for you, and let's make sure we get to heaven together, okay? And he went, yes, let's go to heaven together. I mean, he was genuinely enthusiastic, so he must have had some religious background because he resonated. He goes, okay, I'm praying for you. And I said, I'm praying for you. And he goes, I got you. And I said, I got you. And then then the light changed and I drove off. But you know what? We never know what we can say to someone that will make them feel part of God's family. Isn't that what this is all about? You're not alone out there on the street, starving. You have a family. Beautiful, beautiful. You know when um, you were saying that le- yesterday the gospel, the first reading is a reading that I think is almost the very heart of the Acts of the Apostles. And you can see the family there in this sense. Uh, the day before you have Paul, he's arrived at Philippi. And he's um, tired, and he goes to a um, nearby waterway, which is probably a lake. He wanted to pray. But uh, when he's there, these women, uh, they see him. One was Lydia. And he starts to talk to her. And her heart was open, and she received the word of God. He takes Paul into her family. And he preaches, he baptizes her and the family. And then he goes out and something happens. He preaches and the people, the rabble-rousers get angry and they, 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 they beat him and silence sil- with rods in, their, in this prison. And what happens is, even though they're beaten and, they're, and they're, they're, I can see the blood goozing out and they got these bruises and these, uh, these welts on their bodies, they're singing and they're praying after this. Talk about holy indifference, no? And, uh, and God sends an earthquake. And he's placed in the inner cell and they're bound with chains to a stake. So it was like top security in a, in, a, in a modern prison cell. But God breaks through anyway. But the thing that hit me most, Eric, is uh, Mary is that the chains fall and the jailer, a Roman jailer, pulls out a knife to kill himself. Probably aware of the fact he would have been derelict of his duty, he's going to die anyway, he might as well end end his life. And it's not written, I don't think Paul saw him doing that, but the Holy Spirit inspired him to cry out, don't do anything to yourself. We're still here. So here this man's about to commit suicide and maybe lose his soul for all eternity. I mean, you're going to kill yourself. You don't have enough time to repent, I don't think. <laughs> don't do anything. We're here. Do, harm, do no harm to yourself. Look at how this, it's this one thing that Paul says which transforms uh, a moral tragedy into a huge victory. Then he goes to Paul and he asks one of the most important questions, and this is principle and foundation. The most important question is this. What can I do to be saved? Isn't that principle and foundation? We're here to to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. And Paul preaches to him. He takes him to his house. He's got a family there. He preaches to him, then he's baptized. Talk about a quick RCA program, huh? <laughs> Usually it took a year, that only took about two hours probably. He's baptized and the whole family, then they set the table and they rejoice. And um, one thing that really occurred when I was preaching yesterday and thinking about it is um, we all go through desolation. Mm-hmm. And you teach it, of course, in discernment. We all go through desolation. Father Tim Gallagher always says this. There's no reason why we should be ashamed of desolation. We've got to name it, claim it, and tame it, I say. No? 
There's no reason why we should be ashamed because that's part of being human. But we have to know what to do in it. So my Ignatian interpretation of that passage is uh, how God can intervene and transform a very dense, powerful desolation into consolation by maybe one word. I remember a couple months ago, I was in desolation. It was a Saturday. I think I'd been hearing confessions for eight or nine hours. It's a long day, and that, sometimes it weighs upon you, you know? It can weigh upon you, you know? And uh, someone someone came in and uh, just said said one thing to me. It was maybe five or six words. And right away, I was knocked out of the desolation, and I experienced consolation for, for 24 hours by maybe six words that this person said. And I'm sure that this person, uh, it, was a, it was a gesture of kindness, it was. I'm, I'm pretty sure this person was not even aware the, ef the effect of those few words said to me, and maybe she didn't even plan it. Probably the Holy Spirit was saying to her, say those words because the poor guy had, had a tough day, kind of pulled him out of the pit. <laughs> But uh, I, I, I think about, and the, the more that we're getting into Ignatian exercises, you're teaching it, you are too, at least implicitly, and I'm always doing it also. Um, the more I'm important, uh, aware of the importance of, um, of small gestures done with love. can pull people, that man, he, he could be in hell now. Well, now he's in heaven with all his family. Mm. So... Um, Theater. Once again, it's related to Silas and Paul. They were there. That was a family. Two or more gathered my name. I'm in their midst. So I thought I would share that, Mary. And um, I like that. Eric, um, well, what do you think? Do you have any... Um, well, Father, we're still in the Easter season right now. That's right. So um, what you just said about this lady that came in and uplifted you uh, just with a, a simple sentence. It's really one of the things that you're also talking about, uh, you know, teaching the uh, spiritual exercises. So one of the things about, you know, we're praying for the grace for intensissimo gozo, intense joy. There's another one. <laughs> Maybe I am getting better the at Spanish. Spanish are going to be proud of you. Right? They're going to say, uh, send your grammar book. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, when you said that, how important it is for us to remember uh, that we need to exude mm -hmm. that joy uh, and to be able to transmit that. Um, and like you said, Father, a lot of times it's the Holy Spirit is, is helping out, but it is contagious. So I would imagine that when the person came, the lady came into your confessional, she she wasn't pouting or she probably didn't come in as a sad sack and said something, you know, uplifting to you, but it, how contagious that is. Uh, but we also say the other thing, we can be careful because, uh, you know, desolation can also be contagious as well. So, uh, but it's very encouraging to, to hear that, Father. And I think a lot of us as lay people, we think that the priests are always in consolation and mm -hmm that um, the priests are performing, I mean, they're doing this incredible supernatural um, service. They're participating in this incredible uh, sacrament. Uh, and we don't think of, a lot of times I think lay people don't really think, because the priest, you know, we all see the priests, and um, I'm sure you didn't, you probably didn't look like you were sad, Father, uh, but we expect the priests always to be up because we're expecting them to lift us up. But there is a, there's a, even our Lord, he was fully human and fully divine. And we look at his uh, disposition in the garden and um, we can see the impact that it was having on the, uh, uh, the apostles. They knew that he was, um, that he was definitely in, in desolation. So I think it's a good reminder, Father, for us to remember that, that, uh, that our loving priests, uh, they have difficult days uh, doing that too. But also the, the importance of exuding, uh, you know, it's, uh, we got to remember it's like uh, we 
You can imagine every day being our birthday like Mary is today. She's, uh, she's just beaming over there, and she always is. Uh, you know, we always see Mary smiling. It's usually the first thing I see when I look at Mary every, every day when we come in. I see her out in the parking lot, and she greets me with a big smile. So, you know, it's good, good advice, Father. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to tell a story I heard on John Paul II mm -hmm. from Formed with T Dr. Timothy Gray, somewhat as a co cohesive glue pulling this all together. John Paul II, um, Pope Francis in his homily uh, for the anniversary of the 100th anniversary of John Paul II's birth, uh, he highlighted, highlighted what he believed to be one of the hallmarks of John Paul II. And it was, um, it was his deep prayer life. Now, someone that had worked so much, 103 visits outside of Rome, all these encyclicals, these apostolic letters, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Code of Canon Law, I mean, so much never a man so visible externally in the world as this man. Huh? Traveled around the globe, I don't know how many times. Uh, you would think that someone like this would not, uh, would not have enough time to pray because he's so busy. But um, quite the, quite the, uh, the contrary, in our, in our house here we have St. John Paul II praying, and behind him there's a picture of a lady of Guadalupe right next to the refectory. Then going up the sta stairwell is John Paul II studying. So he's praying and he's studying, and that's, I think, the two different dimensions of the contemplative life. We've got to pray, but we also have to study. But a story they heard with, with Dr. Tim Gray, uh, formed, he's, the, he's uh, the head of the uh, Augustine Institute, was John Paul II was praying his rosary. And uh, this man of uh, probably great importance in the eye of the world, I didn't mention the name of the person, came to him and told the Holy Father when he's praying the rosary, look, it's a pretty serious problem now. And John Paul II kept praying the rosary. And he came back a little bit later and said, look, you're holding this, okay, look, we got some pretty serious problem here. And he kept praying the rosary. Third time he came back to interrupt the Holy Father and said, look, you're holding this, I guess you didn't understand me. There's a serious problem now. And he was praying the rosary, and he picked up and he showed him the rosary. This is the way to solve that problem. Wow. Wow. You know, our tendency as Americans is we want to fix things. Things have to be fixed, they have to be resolved, they have to be in order. And we have to fix it. Would you like to comment on that? I think we have that. I'm in just, our I'm just, I'm just filling in, and we have to fix it, right? It has to be fixed. Well, we have. I'm here, so I must be the one who has to fix it. Eric, what do you think about that? Do you think that we're kind of uh, go-getters? We want to do, and we want to fix the problem. We're very pragmatic. Uh, it's not in order. We uh, we have to resolve the word. We have, we have that Daniel Boone within it. It has to be done. It's my way or the highway, right? That's right. Um, after working in the you know, corporate world for almost 40 years, uh, and sometimes you can fix it and sometimes you can't, but um, the thing that just came to my mind, Father, about uh, that whole idea is like our natural desire is, you know, somebody says there's a big problem, then we, then we start focusing on the problem, right? We focus on the problem. <laughs> And the example that you gave is that um, uh, St. John Paul II was focusing on the problem solver. That was like Peter walking on the water. And what a, a very different uh, way of approaching the problem. And I think that has a lot to do with um, our ability to surrender things to God. But, uh, you know... Uh, I like the comment that you make, Father, just we need to focus on the problem solver um, most of the time, probably. 
John Paul II's life was a very active missionary life, but his prayer life, he he would spend, um, I think in the witness of Hope Point, I'd have to go back and read it, he'd spend most of the time in the morning in prayer and study, starting off the day with his meditation, then prayer and study, and he would pray the Angelus every Sunday. When he was not traveling, he'd pray the Rosary on Saturdays. Um, there's a book that's that he wrote. It's not as well known as some of these encyclicals, and it's called uh, uh, "Crossing the Threshold of Hope." Mm -hmm. Crossing the Threshold of Hope, and it's not a long book. It's somewhat autobiographical. There's a short chapter in this where he summarizes his prayer life. Now, given that many of you are in our Ignatian family and program, I can't just say this to those that are just um, barely moving in the spiritual life because I don't think they're going to understand it. But I think you people will. He's got a chapter where he says that here, his prayer life is related to this. Romans chapter 8. We don't know how to pray as we ought. We don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with, it, with ineffable groans so that we can say Abba, which means Daddy, Abba, Father. The whole essence of that chapter is this idea is John Paul II was trying to pray in unison, uniting his groans with the groans of the Holy Spirit. The other day I was talking to someone about prayer, and this person said something that has uh, made me reflect upon my own prayer life over the past 24 hours in, in, in this area. A person was um, talking about um, prayer after Holy Communion. And this person was citing different saints on how to make a Thanksgiving after Holy Communion. This person was say, citing St. Peter Julian Amard. And he's a French saint that had great devotion to the Eucharist. And he wrote um, a series of little books on, um, on the Eucharist. And it's, uh, it's like, I'll give you some of the uh, St. Joseph and the Eucharist, Holy Communion in the Eucharist, Thanksgiving in the Eucharist, Mary in the Eucharist. Preparation of the Eucharist, about, probably about 25 uh, classic books. And um, she was saying that St. Julian Amard says that after Holy Communion, it's not a bad idea to, after we receive the Holy Communion, to be in silence and let God speak to us. Then we speak to God. And I've been kind of battling with that the past 24 hours. In this sense, there's no dogmatic teaching that what he says is, is, is the way it should be done. And I think, I, think, um, I think everyone has to talk to his spiritual director about that because... Um, those should be the most important moments in our life, even people that are making spiritual communions. And I felt, uh, I felt kind of challenged because the way that I'm wired is <laughs> I, tend to be, I tend to be active and somewhat impulsive. Uh, I'm kind of like Peter jumping in the water, maybe not s swimming too much. Both of you know me. I have a tendency to want, to want to do too much. Father Larry will hold me back. That's just one of my many defects. I want to 
kind of like a bull in the china shop. I want to, I want, I want to do everything, and sometimes I'm trying to grab onto too much, you no, know? and then I have to rely upon both of you to finish the work that I start, you no. Know? But um, I, I'm still, I'm still kind of mulling that over. And um, I don't know if both of you understand what I'm saying. Is um, is I have a tendency when I have the Lord, I just I, I want to praise Him. Uh, I'll often say, "Blessed be God." I just want to praise Him. That's the exercises, right? And I just love the prayer that we prayed today after after Mass. I said, "Soul of Christ, sanctify me." Mm-hmm. And then I'll, I'll 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 usually talk to the Lord, you know, maybe in my own words, but um. That's that's something for my own reflection, because uh, if you're silently in the Lord's presence, His body, blood, soul, and the veins within you, and you're just you're you're basking in His loving presence, He's going to be sanctifying you just by His mere presence. You understand? Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that. My style has been wrong. Maybe that's the way I'm wired. But maybe the the fact that this person was citing a great saint has added something to me that I'm reflecting upon. And um, probably in the near future, I will, after communion, I will maybe spend, maybe I'll spend the first minute just in silence to allow, it's kind of like this. Is like the morning do seeping into the ground or like the process of osmosis is where the, the morning dew is seeping in the ground the ground is dry but the dew is seeping through it and it's making it much more um, supple and receptive to receiving maybe the the seed of the plant to, to uh, plant and to blossom and to sprout um, it's an interesting concept, and I, and I'm not, and I'm not saying for you people that okay, right after communion you have to just be quiet and not say anything. I don't want you to misinterpret me. But maybe what Saint Julian P- Peter Amard is saying is we have a tendency where we always have to be on the move. We have to take the initiative. We've got to do it. We've got to fix it. We got to, you know, resolve the problem. Uh, but also it's. God loved us first. We feel that we have to love God, then He loves you. But really, it's the other way. God loved us first, then we love Him. And I think one of the most difficult things in the exercises is to sit back and let God love us. Mm-hmm. I think they're very difficult for an American. Maybe for the Asians is more difficult, but for Americans, they tend to be very proactive. And it's not totally wrong because you got to get things get things done, but um, I don't know if either of you have a, have a comment on that. Um, Mary? You, what? Mary and then Eric? Yeah. Yes. The birthday girl first, right? <laughs> what do you think, Mary? I, I was really taking in what you were saying, and um, it's something I have to try. Uh-huh. Because I, I don't tend to start just asking him for something, but I too tend to um, praise him and, and adore him. And, you know, I'm, I'm, and I realize I'm talking. <laughs> so I really like... Not to like... say that we can't do that. We, I think we have to talk also. But maybe if we want, want to just... The whole time is just a flood of words without a moment of silence. I think what Amart is saying is, look, talk to the Lord, love him. But also let the Lord speak to you too. That's think that the point that I I'm taking home. What do you think? Yes, and so I like that thought, and I like the thought of first, um, just letting, just sitting with Him, just sitting with mm-hmm. Him. I like that thought. Probably when Mary, when Jesus visited Bethany with Mary and Martha, I imagine Mary talked to Jesus, but maybe they're just sitting sitting there really enjoying each other's presence. What do you think? Yes. And, you know, really, we do do that with um, family or friends, you know, that we're close to. We can just sit in silence, you know, or just, you know, we just we're happy to see each other and, you know, we don't have to start talking right away. Um, 
So it's resonating with me. I'm, I'm, you can hear me sounding it out inside and, you know, trying it on and it's resonating. So, um, I know in adoration I'll do that. Mm-hmm. And yeah. ad- you know, when we, we, when we had adoration in the church, I could just sit, you know, at first just adoring his Eucharistic face. I got that from Insane Jesu, just ad- enjoying his Eucharistic face, him looking at me and me looking at him, you know. I love how Insane Jesu, he talks about my Eucharistic face. So he's, he's by that phrase that Jesus uses, I'm conscious of, I'm looking into the eyes of Jesus, like I look into Eric's eyes or into your eyes. And it's his Eucharistic face. And so I will have times of, you know, just at first, just basking in that. But I've not done that with communion. Eric, um, your reflections on this point? Well, Mary, I was thinking right along the same lines as you were just about um, the whole idea about, you know, when we had the, the great privilege of being able to do adoration inside the church, uh, how a lot of times I felt the same thing where I could just be there and I was very happy and I just felt great privilege just being in, in his presence. And even if there isn't a lot of cognitive things going on and, and sometimes that can make it make it worse but the idea that you had father about the dew soaking in to the dry earth in the morning uh, to me that really is helpful to think about that and you know I've mentioned before to you father and to you Mary that um, I do kind of have a, a, a process which I learned here from you father the acts ACTS when I receive communion uh, I start out with the adoration, which is usually just the divine praises. So, uh, and then, you know, I uh, will tell him I'm sorry for, you know, where I've fallen in the last 24 hours. If when I was able to, you know, go to everybody's able to go to daily mass, and then Thanksgiving, and the time when I would generally try to listen the most was kind of at the whole end of that under supplication. But when I'm asking if I will ask well Lord you know what is it you want me to do or you know I would ask him please reveal your will to me or something that would be more at the end of that but as you were saying that I was thinking why not start doing that just in the very beginning when I'm adoring him and not necessarily adoring him with a bunch of words going through my mind Um, I think I think the divine praises is wonderful and uh, but just to really just to adore him in silence and let him say something if you know if, if there's something to be said that I will be able to hear so I like that idea <laughs> but it is father as you said I have an outline when I receive communion and there I go through that every time and it's it's become you know more part of what I what I do but I think it's good to re- be more reflective and be more in a listening mode is I think that's a it's a good idea. I think all of us are aware of this story, but maybe it's apropos of what we're talking about. Um, one of the saints that I admired most is the Curie of ours, Saint John Maria Vianney, yeah. who spent. Um, sometimes the people forget that before spending the long hours in the confessional, he spent days and weeks where he's praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament and uh, practicing penance. And his prayer was, Lord, send me any suffering, but convert my parish. Mm -hmm. He spent long hours and days and vigils in prayer. Mm -hmm. And that's what eventually broke through the the hardness of the people, because this is right after the French Revolution where almost religion has been destroyed in France. And so he's sent to this place in the boondocks where, you know, people were living on an animal level more than on a, on a spiritual level, but he was not going to give up. And then once he started to get back to, uh, people started to come back to church by, by going to confession, but it came, first of all, his prayer and his penance and his trust in God's mercy. Um, I'm sure both of you remember the story of, um, there was a peasant that was standing at the back of the church for uh, long hours. And uh, this happened for a while and the cure of ours, uh, 
his curiosity was piqued, so he thought that he would approach this man and just ask him what's going on. And the, and, uh, the curator of virus asked him, what, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm praying. And the curator of virus asked him, what do you say to the Lord? And he said, I don't say anything. I look at him and he looks at me and I'm get up filled with joy. Mm -hmm. So that might be... And what I'm saying to our friends here is, and I'm kind of challenging myself because um, at times I think the Lord wants us just to unload and talk to him mm -hmm. and do maybe all the talking. Mm -hmm. It might be. Um, but it's, it's, it helped me because it's opened up a window that I've never really, um, I've really never gone through yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think I have, but in a limited way. But it might be sometime that you receive communion and you're, you're making it like you're making a spiritual communion. We usually give you 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes uh, after the Mass. Mm -hmm. um, there's no reason why you can't just close your eyes, tell the Lord you love Him, you adore Him and worship Him, and then allow the Lord to love you within your heart. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a, a certain mystical contemplative dimension to our exercises, to our family, that, that um, I think we have to hear it because I'm sure a lot of people that are following us, uh, I really feel a lot of them, they're growing. Mm -hmm. They're growing in their prayer life. They're saying their rosary. They're making their holy hour. They're doing spiritual reading. They're struggling with, with, uh, with health issues, maybe family issues. But I think a lot of, a lot of our people in this family, they just have a lot of goodwill, mm -hmm. a oh, lot of yes. love. Oh, yes. And uh, mm -hmm. when all is said and done, what's most important in the world is to love God and to let God love us. When we get to heaven, we're not going to be doing a lot of things, but we're basically going to be loving God and letting God love us in union with the angels and saints with, with, with of course, Mary, the mother of God. Mary, would you have to, um, would you like to comment on this? I, I think you said it very well and you gave me a lot to think about. You, you gave me a lot to think about and um, uh, it's, I'm just, I'm just thinking about what you're saying. I'm, it's just uh it's that dew that's, that's sinking in. It's, I'm just really taking in what you're saying. And, but something in me is resonating, is resonating that um, I am just glad to be with him. Yes. And that's what that's about. Eric, would you like to say something before we, I give my final blessing? Beautiful. It's, uh, I think, a beautiful way to wrap up the session tonight uh, in, uh, in contemplating that most intimate part of our life when we receive our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, whether that's a sacramental communion or in a spiritual communion, to relish that and to understand that um, it is the most important part of our day, and it could be the most important part of our life because we never know that we'll have the opportunity for it again. And so, uh, you know, it could be our viaticum each time we receive, whether it's sacramental or a spiritual communion. So uh, I think that's another way to look at it is how do we want to spend that time with him? And a lot of times it could be just, like you said, just relishing him, how beautiful that is. So I'll give, I'll give the blessing and happy birthday to you Thank once you. again. Yes. Thank you. And we're going to be praying the chaplet. I'll be offering my chaplet for you and all your attention, as well as for your, your mom and dad and your relatives. Thank you so much, Father. The Lord be with you. And, and with your, your spirit. spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen.